are listening to international investment advisor Doug Goldstein on the Goldstein on Gelt Show, the financial show where we'll talk about how you can make the most of your money. With all the confusing financial chatter bombarding you each and every day, Goldstein on Gelt will give you the practical information you want and need about living a financially stable life. Here's your host, money maven Doug Goldstein. Okay, we are back. We are talking with Professor Robert Schiller, who's an economist, he's an academic, he's a best-selling author, and he's currently at Yale University. Bob, it's a pleasure to have you. My pleasure. I currently mean 30 years at Yale University. <laughs> All right. Well, they, they must be very lucky to have you, and I'm sure they're very proud of your new book called Finance and the Good Society. Tell me something. The title of the book actually makes finance sound like a pretty good thing, whereas these days people feel the financial world is pretty crummy. How did you come up with the title? Partly in reaction to the crisis, uh, because I saw so much hostility being expressed. Uh, it came, I actually wrote it before Occupy, or started writing it before Occupy Wall Street. But there, there is a heightened sense of uh, inequality, and it, people associate that with uh, finance, and it seems like a way of worsening inequality. When I think Really, uh, our financial arrangements are the backbone of our economy, and if they're done right, they ought to reduce inequality. I think the complaint is that they're not being done right. Right, and so that's what this book is about. So uh, the one problem is democratize finance, make it accessible to everyone, and make it serve the people better, and that that involves innovations. Uh, another theme that you hear a lot these days is skepticism about financial innovation. People think that they're, well, Paul Volcker, the former chair of the Fed recently, two years ago, said he can't think of any useful financial innovation except the automated teller machine, which is really an engineering invention. <laughs> Certainly there are a lot of innovations which, I mean, even as a financial advisor, I have to say that that uh, I feel that sometimes they're just t repackaging and repackaging things that you know, often they get a, get a fancy title like a structured product. People don't understand them. The, the people who sell them don't understand them. Is that the type of innovation you're referring to? Well, uh, structured products have gotten an especially bad name. But they're, they have analogs that have good names. Insurance is good, most people think. They believe in it. Insurance was first created, you know, hundreds of years. It took a long time for people to think it was good. But you know what? A, a put option is the same thing as an insurance policy. It's just packaged a little differently. Okay, so a put option is something that, again, I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand. But if they buy, let's say, a packaged five-year illiquid bank note, which is linked to the inverse of the LIBOR, right, which okay. most people don't even know what that is. I mean, I, as you know, my day job is that I'm a financial advisor. I, I right. sit in Jerusalem, I do financial planning, investment services, and all the time these companies come to me and say, hey, Doug, why don't you sell this product to your clients? And it comes with a 400-page prospectus. It seems like it's not reasonable. Well, the thing, one of the themes of my book is that finance is part of our civilization, and it's a set of rules for people to interact with. And people uh, are the problem. <laughs> Any set of rules is going to be abused by some people. Uh, it's human nature. I, I, I think let's not be excessively negative about human nature. People have a generous and altruistic side. But they also have kind of a let's grab the goods and run side. So any set of some people to be deviant tricking. And that's why we have all these lawyers <laughs> making, writing 400-page prospectus to, uh, uh, to prevent lawsuits. They, it, it's gotten kind of combative. But, you know, people are combative. So the, under the rules that we have, I think that we've civilized the combat. We've limited the damage from abuse that, that happened. Used to be the thing you'd be upset about is some soldiers came by and shot my mother or something like that. <laughs> Not the way it is anymore. All they do is cheat your mother a little bit. 
Mm -hmm. So we've improved. Our civilization has improved. The fundamental problem is people uh, and the financial institutions are good ways of helping improve the situation. So the innovations that you're referring to would be the, the oversight of these financial institutions to make people nicer or force them to be nicer? Yeah, remember that uh, Vladimir Lenin thought that he could make people nicer. <laughs> he would create a new, they called them Soviet man or homo sovieticus by propagandizing, uh, by getting people, you know, their mindset changed. It didn't really work. I guess maybe it worked in some dimensions, but... You know, it led to a sullen, oppressed uh, population with lost entrepreneurship. Didn't work. So you go and let do their own things. And they're going to be aggressive. They're, humans are status-seeking. They, they want to get advantage. It's true everywhere. It's a human universal. So we have a set of rules that limits the damage. And that rules, those rules are partly written by the government, but I think more written by the financial community itself often in, in, in working with the government. Okay. We are talking with Robert Schiller, who's an economist. He is a best-selling author. He's a professor at Yale University for about 30 years. He's the author of a book called Finance and the Good Society, as well as many other books. Bob, let's focus a little more on that, but the financial community that you're discussing. One of the complaints that I hear all the time is people say, you know, the CEO of such and such a company made uh, 50 million or 100 million dollars when the shareholders actually lost money. So I always think, why don't the shareholders get together and vote against him on the board? But it seems that's not happening. Is there a system that we could expect that would be a good checks and balances, or is this really going to continue a division between the, the senior members of the board and the shareholders that they're really at odds instead of on the same side? Yeah, I think it's a little bit fuzzy. There, there are stories of boards voting uh, high salaries to their crony CEO. You know, we give you this, uh, someday you'll return the favor to us. Uh, that happens, and then the stockholders are too dispersed to see what, what's going on. But other things happen that push salaries up. So suppose the, a company has billions in revenue, uh, but it's not making a profit. And that someone says, well, let's hire a CEO from uh, another company that, that's turned a company around, that knows how to turn a profit. Uh, and so you go to this guy, and he says, no, I won't do it. You know, I'm tired. I've done too much of this thing. So you say, let's offer you $50 million a year. That's a drop in the bucket if you make billions. And it sounds reasonable. You go to the shareholders, if you did, at an annual meeting and say, we're thinking of hiring this guy. And they'll say, yes. Please do it, because someone heading a big enterprise like that can turn it around. And you want someone, you don't know that this person will succeed, but you want someone who has experience. So you're saying that they're actually worth it, that people get paid uh, literally hundreds of millions of dollars, that they're bringing value somehow. <laughs> it's a mixture. Rakesh Kurana uh, is a professor at Harvard Business School, and he wrote a book called The Search for the Charismatic, C Charismatic CEO. And his claim was that people had too much faith in some great man coming in and turning <clears throat> a company around, and that, in fact, it often works backwards. The great man comes in, and he feels he has to do something dramatic, so he takes big risks that uh, a more devoted uh, supporter of the company wouldn't do. It's a mixture. We may have gone too far in the executive uh, dimension. But on the other hand, I do believe companies would rationally, logically pay tens of millions of dollars to a CEO. And do you think that applies also in the not-for-profit world where some of the CEOs of major charities also are making multi-million dollar salaries? Right. Uh, non-profit and profit, the distinction between those two is not as clear as you'd think. In fact, there's been a trend uh, over recent decades for more and more private sector type bonuses to be paid to non-profits. I don't see why that's a problem. Non-profits have to get good people. The problem with the government is that they, uh, because voters object to this kind of thing, they don't pay high salaries. Fortunately, people feel a, a kind of spirit of uh, national 
<laughs> desire to support the nation, and many of them will take uh, low, very low salaries in government. But even so, I think it's a problem better if they were more willing to pay market wages to government leaders. Huh. It'd be interesting to find out where that money would come from. It's a problem of politics. And there's a lot of poor people who vote. And a $10 million salary just sounds crazy to them because they can't picture it. They can't imagine it. Another theme of my book is that really these people should give the money away. And uh, that's what often happens. It doesn't happen as much as we'd like. But you know, if we're going to talk about improving our society. I think it would be better if there was more of a sense of philanthropy and not family dynasties. Well, in the United States alone, the, the charity rate is something below 1%. And you know, from the presidents all the way down to the poorest people, it seems there's very little philanthropy and it's less than half that in Europe. I, I, that sounds like very optimistic thinking. Well, we have some leaders. You know, uh, Bill Gates and... Um, Warren Buffett recently launched a giving pledge, and the pledge was for billionaires to give away half of their wealth to charity. Somehow that didn't impress me so much. I figure that uh, Warren Buffett going from 50 to 25 billion is he's still going to have more money than you know all of my neighbors. Well, see, now, the thing about Warren Buffett, okay, uh, I don't know him. I've never met him. But if if you were how old is he now? He's 70s. Yeah, late 70s. Uh, he, you know, he knows he doesn't have much time. What is he going to do with all that money? Well, really? For the past 30 years, why didn't he give it away? Well, I think people like to accumulate. They, they like to, uh, and so this is another theme of my book. We have to have charitable giving laws that encourage people to set up foundations where they can contribute. And I would like to have the kind of thing where you could get the money back if you change your mind. <laughs> Sorry, but we want to get people onto the course of setting up a family uh, or foundation. And that, that would be the status. They would get their social status by doing that. And that's what I'm hopeful we can move somewhat toward. I, I certainly agree. I think that would be great. I just don't see how any policies... Well, see, what is Warren Buffett going to do? If Imagine yourself as Warren Buffett. Now, you're 70-some years old. You don't have much time. Now, uh, what, what are you going to do? Just leave it? To your children. Well, what I, I believe Warren Buffett has done, I'm not sure that I've got the fact here right, is he's endowed his children with foundations to manage. Mm -hmm. And he hasn't given them uh, billions. I believe he's given them billions to manage as a foundation. And that gives them status. And everyone wants their children to have status. But it's just silly and ridiculous to build multiple mansions and have expensive parties that, that are just show off uh, consumption. So uh, we want to move toward a society where people are seek status through their charitable giving, and I think that's possible. In fact, we're already there. I, you know, incidentally, I believe the Jewish community is already there. I'm not Jewish, but I understand that Jews tend to be very charitable, mm -hmm. and in America, we are proud amount of charitable giving here. This is a trend that I think is cultural. And it can be developed, and it should be developed. That's one of the themes of my book. Well, I certainly support that. That's a, it, for, for, as we say here in Israel, from your lips to God's ears. I hope that uh, things change in that direction. We've been talking to Professor Robert Schiller. He's an economist. He's a best-selling author. He's at Yale. He wrote a book recently called Finance and the Good Society, which I think people should read because it shows you that not all guys in finance are bad guys. And in fact, shows how, uh, if I can even quote something that you said, you said, finance is the science of goal architecture. And I think that's a very good point because we spend a lot of time talking with our clients about setting goals. Bob, in the last few seconds, just tell me, how can people follow your work? Well, uh, I have a website, robertschiller.com. I have a online course, you can a whole course. If you search on Schiller uh, and Open Yale, you can find that. You can take you can take my exams too, but I won't grade you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Robert Schiller, thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. 
You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.